Hey guys, I'm Evan with Cypress Design Works. Today we're going to be talking about something that I think is really important in woodworking, but isn't talked about all that often, which is dust collection. Uh, there's a lot of different routes that you can go, a lot of different style systems you can get, and a lot of different ways you can plumb your ducting if you decide to go with permanent ducting. So I want to talk about the do's and don'ts, a couple tips and tricks, and uh, hopefully you guys can learn something, and if you're about to set up a system, this will help you... Uh, make some good decisions and avoid some pitfalls that a lot of woodworkers fall into. So stick around. I hope you guys enjoy. If you guys like this kind of content, we'd appreciate it if you guys would go ahead and subscribe and hit the notification bell so you guys can see this type of content in the future. First topic I want to cover is dust collection systems and the different options that you have within the dust collection world for the base equipment, which is the actual dust collector itself. There's a variety of things that can affect how well the system's going to work and how effective it's going to be in your shop. The first decision you need to make is how much horsepower do you need? And this can vary depending on which brand you go with because the higher end brands are much more efficient, have much better airflow, and have potentially better filters, which is going to allow less horsepower to pull the same amount of chips. So you want to look at a combination of things, but my recommendation typically for a one-man shop, if you're going to be running the line directly to the tool, not doing inline ducting, a two horsepower or a one and three quarter horsepower is plenty of power. Uh, something where you can, again, run it directly to the tool versus uh, having to pull the chips up to the ceiling and across. You don't need a ton of horsepower. Uh, the typical one and three quarter horsepower systems are plenty for single tool operations in a one-man shop where you're going to direct line the system. When you want to start doing things like what we have in our shop where all the tools are hard lined, the dust has to go up to the ceiling and across in some places a 20, 25 foot run, now you definitely want to be looking at a three or even a five horsepower system. Again, depending on the brand you go with and their efficiency. Another thing to consider when you're specking out your actual dust collection system is whether you want to go with a single stage or a dual stage. And this is a pretty simple distinction, but I'll explain it to you. A single stage system, basically the dust and chips get pulled through the impeller and dumped into a bag. The bag and filter is all kind of one system. Sometimes there's a baffle, but typically that's still considered a single stage system. And, you know, all of the dust gets basically pushed against the filter and it usually drops down into a bag. Very simple very inefficient. A uh, two-stage system is typically a little bit more expensive, but it contains what's called the cyclone typically, which is something where the dust kind of spins around in a circle and drops into a barrel before it gets to your filter. So this helps prevent your filter from getting clogged, and it also helps with separation. So it's a lot easier to change out bags typically on a cyclone two-stage system versus a single-stage system. Uh, the main benefit of a two-stage is you usually can get away with changing your filters less often, you have to clean your filters less often, and it's just, again, easier to work with. Uh, overall, I highly recommend a two-stage system if you can afford it, but if it's not in the budget, you can buy two-stage converters, like uh, Oneida makes a, a dust deputy, uh, which is a add-on cyclone for a single-stage system, which is a really great and expensive option for people who don't want to invest in a larger three-stage system, or two-stage system. Another thing to consider when you're specking out your system is whether you're going to go with a a filter bag system or a pleated filter system. So the filter dictates how much airflow can get through your system and therefore how well that motor can pull air through your system. So a lower horsepower system with a pleated filter will pull just as much air as a slightly higher horsepower system with the canister bag. Um, the reason for that is it's all about surface area. So the bag is basically a felt bag, I think is the material, and it's pushing air through a single area. Versus a pleated filter, it's zigzags of filter, and therefore the surface area is significantly higher. So that tiny little canister right there has over 200 surface feet of filter, which is really, really powerful in letting a lot of air flow through, and therefore you're not restricting the motor's ability to push, which is really what it's trying to do. So if you can go with the pleated filter, there's two advantages. One, typically you're going to get significantly better airflow. Two, it's usually a much smaller footprint, so the larger... Uh, surface area filter bags are sometimes even 10 feet tall, so you can get a much smaller package. And the third and most important, in my opinion, the efficiency of the filter goes way up. So the amount of particles that it can filter out is much, much better. So a pleated filter, typically you can get very good airflow while also filtering very small particles, which are really dangerous to you as a woodworker to be breathing in. So going with a pleated filter is a well worthwhile investment because it's going to do a lot for you 
And in my opinion, right after I spec the system, I'm specking the filter because that's just as important as a good system is a good filter because that's really the goal is to prevent you from breathing in harmful dust. And the filter is what determines that. Again, if you're looking to save money though, you can buy a cheaper system and add a canister filter to it. There are plenty of companies that make aftermarket canister filters that can replace the bag on your simple single stage system that will not only help again with airflow, but with dust efficiency of getting those particle sizes down, which is really helpful. Another feature of dust collectors that's worth looking at when you're specking out a system is the amount of noise that it creates. Uh, cheaper, lower end dust collectors can be extremely loud, and it's a tool that you have running for long periods of time in your workshop. So specking out a system, if you're in the higher end range that has a built-in suppressor or muffler in the filter stack, goes a long way. This three horsepower system is about half as loud as my last two horsepower system. So it's much quieter, even though it's a bigger system, because it has that inline suppressor, which is a game changer. So I highly recommend looking for that if you are somebody who's in the market for a higher end system. One more thing to consider when you're specking out your dust collection system is how high off the ground the inlet is on the actual dust collector. This may not seem like an important factor, but having this system higher to the ceiling, if you're going to be running duct work, is a huge benefit. If you can tell by my system, I have a direct run coming out, and I wish that was much higher. So buying a system that has a height that's already closer to the ceiling, if you're planning on running duct work, is a huge advantage. And in the converse of that, if you're somebody who's planning on running it directly to your tool, having an inlet that's close to the ground is much better. So picking that out is something that you should be considering when you're specking your system. Now that we've specced out our system, let's talk about the ducting if we're gonna do an inline dust collection system where we're gonna have everything routed to a specific tool or general area of the workshop. The first thing to consider is what size piping do we wanna use and what type of material? So the first question is about size, and that is pretty simple, and that is you want to start off coming out of your dust collection system with the largest pipe that you possibly can. So your main run, you want to be a very wide diameter. So if you have a 6-inch inlet, you want to run a 6-inch pipe. If you have a 7-inch, 8-inch, 9-inch, you want to start with that. And after a little bit of a run, you want to drop down in diameter, in my opinion, to a 6-inch run if you have a 3-horsepower or bigger system, and to a 4-inch port if you have a 2-horsepower or below. The main goal is to have a good balance of pressure and airflow. So the smaller the diameter port you go or the diameter piping you go, the higher the pressure is going to get, but the lower the airflow is going to get. So on a system that's got enough power, you can use a six inch run and that will have enough airflow to pull the heavy chips up and enough pressure to make sure that they get all the way to the top of the pipe from the tool up to your ceiling and across your run. So. If you go too large of a diameter with too small of a system, you won't have enough pressure to pull the chips all the way to the ceiling, which is gonna cause clogging and issues on your machine. We wanna leave the biggest pipe coming out of the inlet we can though, because that's gonna help with once the chips are at the ceiling, getting all the chips through nice, good airflow, and it's gonna help with reducing turbulence, which will help your separation system be more efficient. It's also important to note that you wanna start your piping with a straight run. I see a lot of woodworkers who have a transition like a 45 degree angle or a 90 degree angle right out of their system and sometimes you have to do that but if you can avoid it you should because what you want to do to get maximum efficiency on your separation system is have a nice straight run that's going to let those chips settle into a normal low turbulent pattern and when it hits your filter it's going to be much more efficient than if you have turbulent chips coming in that are really sporadic as far as material of your runs there's two options that are pretty common metal like I have in my shop or PVC. You'll see some people using the convoluted flexible hosing in their runs and that's a really really bad idea for the main section of your dust collection system. And the reason for that is those little ribs that are in flexible dust collection are really really turbulent and create a pressure loss because air gets pushed into those grooves and sent back the wrong direction. So it's very inefficient. You'll also get dust that will settle in those grooves and you don't want buildup of dust in your system if you can help it for fire hazard reasons as well as just efficiency reasons. So you're better off using PVC or metal ducting if you can figure out how to make that work. Having said that, it's great to use the flexible hosing when you get right to the tool. I have about uh, two to three feet of flexible dust collection hose at every tool pretty much because it makes getting that final connection much more flexible and it also gives you a little bit of ability to move your tools around if you need to after you've done your hard wiring of your system. Let's talk about transitions. So when I say that, I mean turning your system a little bit. So 45 degrees, 90 degrees, uh, splitting off from one into two paths, 
all of these are options with dust collection system if you need to get to multiple tools and getting from your main trunk off to a tool that's not directly in line with your main trunk. The key to maximizing the amount of pressure and the efficiency of your system though is to minimize how dramatic you make these transitions. So for example, a tight 90 degree turn is much less efficient than a longer 90 degree turn, which is even less efficient than a 45 with a straight and another 45. So depending on the size and spacing of your shop, you can pick between those different options. If you've got the space, you can do a 45 degree turn, a straight and another 45 degree turn. If you've got a little bit less space, what they call a long radius 90 degree turn is a great option. And if you have really tight space and you need to make a quick turn, it's very inefficient, but you can use a traditional right angle turn. Another joint that's very common in dust collection system is what's called a split or a Y. Uh, what you wanna avoid if you're transitioning from one run into two are what are called T connections, where there's a 90 degree offshoot of your main line. This 90 degree turn, again, like we just talked about, is very inefficient and is gonna create a lot of turbulence and backflow, which is not good for the efficiency of your system. What you wanna use instead is what's called a Y, W-Y-E. And this is a joint that looks like the letter Y, go figure. This joint is a much more uh, smooth transition. It's a 45 degree joint instead of a 90 degree joint like we talked about, which, which is much more efficient. Um, and it's a much better option than a 90 degree turn if you can fit it into your shop workflow. Although a lot of the ducting in the shop is HVAC ducting, a lot of it isn't. And let me explain why that matters. HVAC systems are designed to push hot and cold air throughout your house. So all of the joints where the male and the female meet they overlap in a way that is beneficial for pushing air through a system. But when we take it and we flip it in reverse, which is what we do with dust collection, we're pulling air, that efficiency becomes very poor. So some things doesn't matter. Some things are reversible, like the straight piping. You can buy HVAC straight piping and use it in a dust collection system and just flip the pipe around. But something like a Y is a good example of a part that you need to order from a dust collection supply company or uh, have specially made because the Y is going to be going in the wrong direction and you're going to have potentially a buildup of dust in that joint because the transition's in the wrong direction, which can be a fire hazard, and it's also not going to be efficient for you at all. So some, some you can spec HVAC parts for and some you need to go to a dust collection supply company. The other thing to worth noting about HVAC stuff is it's typically much lower grade because there's not a vacuum being pulled on the system. So the gauge steel with HVAC, if you go to like a Home Depot, is going to be typically 26 gauge or 28 gauge in a really low end system. Uh, for dust collection systems, I typically try to go 24 gauge or lower. So the lower the gauge, the thicker the steel, the larger of pressure it can withstand without collapsing on itself. Although you can get away with the higher gauge, thinner steels, if you close off all of your blast gates and turn your system on, you might collapse your system, which is not something you want to do. I've seen plenty of people that have done that, and it is a nightmare. So I would recommend going with 24 or 22 gauge steel if you're running a larger system. As I mentioned, there is an alternate to steel ductwork, and that is PVC. So depending on where you live, you may be able to get 6 inch and 4 inch PVC and joints for a lot cheaper than the metal joints, and it works just as well. The only thing you need to be aware of with PVC is that it can build up static because it's not self-grounding. As metal, obviously, the charge can run through it back to your system, which you should be grounding. But with PVC, it doesn't do that naturally because it's an insulator. So if you're going to run PVC, there's a couple different ways you can ground it. I'm not going to go into that here, but you want to make sure that you do address that. It's not hard, but it's something that's worth doing to prevent static discharge in your shop, both to shock you and potentially to cause a fire. Although I think that's pretty low risk, it is something worth considering. Another tip to getting even more efficiency out of your system is to seal your joints. So with PVC, you can glue the joints. With metal ductwork like this, you can tape the joints. These are great ways to maximize the efficiency in your system because each and every one of those joints and transitions is letting a little bit of air escape. And over the course of a large system like this, that equates to a lot of loss of pressure, which is not a good thing. So take the time to seal your joints. I want to talk to you guys about blast gates. Blast gates are a way to seal off certain sections of your dust collection system from being used when you turn the system on. So what you can see right behind me here is what's called a blast gate. And I have one at each individual tool, but depending on your budget and your layout, you may have one or two or several in your system. But a blast gate essentially allows you to isolate where you're pulling vacuum from so that your whole system isn't always on. Only this part of the system that you want is on. In a system like mine, where there's a main trunk and two main branches coming off, it's important to have blast gates 
at the main trunk. So for example, this run that's behind me is a side run that runs parallel to my main trunk. And I don't want that 20 foot run having to pressurize all the way to the tool. Even if I have a blast gate at the tool, I want to make sure that I'm cutting it off as close to the system as possible. And this is going to prevent that whole main trunk line from having to be pressurized. Even though there's no gate open pulling air, it still allows the system to be much more efficient if I have blast gates at both the branch offshoot and at the tool. So it's a great option if you're really trying to squeeze out as much efficiency as possible. As far as types of blast gate goes, there's a bunch of different types. There's good, better, best. There's cheap plastic ones, there's nicer metal ones, there's auto cleaning ones, and there's automated ones that open and close automatically when you turn the tool on and it detects a voltage through the wire. Um, I find myself uh, somewhere in the middle. I really like the self-cleaning ones that uh, Lee Valley makes. Um, they prevent sawdust from building up and again, preventing the system from operating efficiently. Uh, but even the plastic ones will get you by certainly on the smaller systems, not a problem. And even homemade blast gates work great. I've seen some really cool ingenious ways to make blast gates out of plywood that are cheap and work pretty dang well. So scale that based on your business. I wanna talk about when is the right time to reduce down to a smaller diameter. For example, if we have a six inch trunk on our system, but our tool only has a four inch port. When do you want to go down to four inches? And the answer is right at the tool. It's critical to have a six inch run, if that's what your main run is, all the way to the tool and then reduce it down to a five inch, six inch or whatever. So you want to basically keep the longest run you can or the largest run you can all the way to the tool and this is going to maximize the amount of airflow through your system. On that same train of thought though, it is really important to make sure you have enough air inlet size for your system. So with my three horsepower system, I never like to have less than one four inch port open. So for example, when I go do my oscillating spindle sander, it only has a two and a half inch port. So the way I get around only having a two and a half inch port open is I have a splitter and I basically run a blank two and a half inch port that's just pulling air from the shop. So I basically have four inches of airflow even though I'm only running two and a half inches at the tool. Basically, if you only ran a two and a half inch on my size system, or if you only ran a four inch on a larger system, you'd be starving the system of air and it's not gonna have enough airflow to pull chips all the way to the ceiling and back to your system. And it can also put a strain on your motor, which is not good for motor life. So you wanna make sure that you look into how much CFM your system wants to be pulling and make sure that it has enough port size running. So how much hose diameter you have available for it to pull air through the system. So that pretty much sums up dust collection. If you guys have any questions that I didn't address in this video, I'd be happy to answer them down in the comments. And if you guys enjoyed this video, again, we'd appreciate it if you gave us a subscription and uh, hit that notification bell so you guys can see this type of content when it pops up next. Thanks, guys. Hope you guys have a great day.